Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks also very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak here. I apologize for because many of you have already seen a part of this talk about observability and control. The new point maybe is about stabilization of water. So the problem I am considering is the following, the generation and absorption of water wave. And here we are going to consider the problem in a rectangular tank, which means that we are considering a bounded container with a fluid inside. And <coughs> the container has vertical walls, which are vertical. The container has a bottom, which is flat. And also you have right angle everywhere. Okay, you have right angle everywhere. So there are two pictures, one with a 3D fluid and one with a 2D fluid. For the sake of simplicity, we are considering only 2D waves. Okay, we are going to consider a, a 2D wave, but in principle, the result should apply also for a three-dimensional fluid. I am going to present results in collaboration with Pietro Baldi and Daniel Anquan about the controllability of 2D gravity capillary wave. And also results about observability and stabilization, which applied for either 2D or 3D wave with or without surface tension. So the problem of controllability and stabilization of water wave has been studied a lot for equation describing water wave in subasymptotic regime like the benjamin Ono equation, or the KDV equation, or the saint benoit equation. And there are many, many people that have worked on this, on this topic. And to name a few, I can quote Jean-Michel Coron, Camille Laurent, Philippe Linares, Jay Mortega, or also Petit, Rosier, and Russell. Here, the difference with this, with this work is that we are considering the full model. That is, we are considering the dynamics of an incompressible liquid in a fluid domain omega, with a free surface. This is a key point. We are considering a fluid domain which is time dependent. And to fix notation, we assume that at time t, at a given time t, the fluid domain is of the following form. This is a set of points x and y in 0L times r, such that y is bigger than minus h and smaller than eta of t and x. And the fact that the domain has a free surface is means that eta is an unknown of the problem. Okay? So we are going to consider a fluid domain which depends on time, omega of t, in a bounded container. And the free surface is the curve with the equation y equal eta of tx. So the physical parameters here are the depth, which is h, and the size of the domain, which is L, capital L. Okay, this is the fluid domain. Inside the fluid domain, the fluid motion is determined by its Eulerian velocity, which is a vector field from omega to R2, and the equation by which the motion is to be determined are well known for two, two centuries. These are the incompressible Euler equation, dTv plus V <coughs> gradient V plus the gradient of P plus GY is equal to zero. Okay. Capital P is the fluid pressure. G is the acceleration of gravity. So this is the usual Euler equation. This is the incompressibility constraint. Divergence of V is equal to zero inside the fluid domain. Okay, so inside the fluid domain, the equations are, are well known. And we have also boundary condition on the walls, on the bottom, and on the free surface. These boundary conditions are the following. First, we assume that V dot N is equal to zero, both on the bottom and on the walls. Okay, the usual solid wall boundary condition. Then the problem is determined by two boundary conditions on the free surface. Firstly, we assume that on the free surface, that is here, we, we no longer have v dot n equal to zero. We have instead dt of eta is equal to the square root of one plus the derivative of eta, eta x squared, times v dot n. 
And secondly, this is a kinematic equation that describes the motion of the free surface. And the second equation is the balance of forces across the free surface. This is an equation for the difference between the pressure inside the fluid and the external pressure, the pressure in the air. We assume that the jump of pressure at the free surface is proportional to the mean to the curvature. That is, P minus Px is equal to minus kappa times dx of eta x divided by square root of 1 plus, plus eta x squared. So the physical parameters are g and kappa, the surface tension coefficient. P is the pressure and Px is the external pressure. <laughs> In this talk, we consider the case with surface tension, which means that we assume that kappa is equal to 1. And another assumption that we make is that V is irrotational. The curl of V is zero. Okay? Merci. So just the important notation are eta is the free surface elevation. V is the Eulerian fluid velocity. We assume that curl of V is equal to zero, and hence we can write V as the gradient of some function phi, which is the velocity potential. This is a scalar function. <coughs> okay, now I'm going to describe the problem of controllability. The question is very easy to, to explain. We start from, from a, yes? What happens with the boundary condition at the point of triple junction between the solid, uh, the fluid, and the... <coughs> this is not a problem here. Because as I will explain later, we can extend this problem to a problem defined on the wall line. Mm -hmm. So it's hitting it vertically, uh, for example. Yes. So there's always a right angle. There is always a right angle. The right angle po condition is propagated by the equation. But I have to say, Vlad has a point, which is... I don't have, excuse me? Because Vlad has a point, because every interface has a free energy. An interface between water and wall does, water and air does, air and wall does, and there's generally a meniscus which applies pressure, yeah. which applies a force to... The, so saying that it's, it's uh, the normal is assuming that, that, that there's no uh, wall... Yes, I'm making this assumption. I'm making this assumption, and this assumption is propagated in time. So the problem is the following. You have a container with a fluid at rest inside, <coughs> okay? And you want, by some means, to generate a wave, okay? Starting from this fluid, you want to generate a wave. That is, you want to generate a free surface, you want to generate a fluid motion inside, and you want to be able to do that in some time capital T. To generate a wave, you have of course many ways to act on a, on a fluid, on a container. Here we are going to consider what is possibly the simplest way, according to the mathematical analysis, which is to blow above the free surface. Of course, if you blow above the free surface, you are going to generate a wave. And the qu question is, is it possible to blow above a localized or confined portion of the free surface and generate a wave. More precisely, the question is the following. The mathematical question is the following. Given some time t, that is given in advance, given a finite state, eta final, v final, in some space x, given an interval a, b, the domain omega, which is equal to the interval a, b, find the pressure, a value of the external pressure at the free surface, it is a function of t and x, which is supported in 0t times omega, such that the unique solution of the water wave equation with initial data 0 is such that the solution coincides at time t, capital T, with the final state that is given in advance. So this is a controllability question. <coughs> And then there is an observation that, in this case, one can see that the assumption that the fluid is irrotational is meaningful because you start from something that is irrotational and you have a conservative force 
So the flow will be rotational at any time. OK, so this is a question. Now, the first thing to do is to reduce ourselves to the case where there is no lateral walls. And this is done in a standard way. We reduce our ourselves to the case where omega of t is, in fact, the set of points x and y in r times r, so that y is larger than minus h and smaller than eta. And to do that, we use a classical periodization and symmetrization process. We first symmetrize the fluid domain, and then we extend it by periodicity. Okay. By so doing, we are reduced with the fluid which is periodic. This raises, of course, a lot of questions about regularity. Because when you symmetrize, you could introduce singularities. So there are some subtle questions about regularity and the analysis of the Cauchy problem at a low regularity level. I am not going to discuss this question. This uh, was studied by, with um, Nicolas Burke and Claude Zully for the case without surface tension, and more recently by Thibaut de, de Poiferé for the case with surface tension. So now I can state the first result, which is about controllability, and it is a local result. Controllability of two-dimensional gravity, capillary, water wave. For that, I just need to introduce one more notation. The notation is the notation, sorry. The observation is the following, as you have already seen in the talk. Since the divergence of V is equal to zero, <coughs> phi is an harmonic function. Moreover, you know that the Neumann derivative is zero on the wall and the bottom because of the solid wall boundary condition. So phi is fully determined by its, tra <coughs> by its traits on the free surface. And this is why it is convenient to introduce the function psi, which is the evaluation of phi on the free surface. So the nice point is that this is a function of t and x, whereas this function is defined on a domain with free surface, okay? Whereas this function is a function of time and x, which is in the torus. Okay, the other notation is that h mu is the usual subway space of order mu, and the index m will refer to the fact that function with mean value zero. So the statement of the main result with Pietro Baldi and Daniel and Quinn is the following. Given any time t, it can be arbitrarily small, and given any non-empty interval, included in, in 0L, there exists an index L, S, large enough, and a number M0, small enough, such that for any initial data and any final data in this space, Hs plus 1 half M times Hs, su such that the norm initially is smaller than M0, and the norm at the finite point is smaller than M0, you can find an external pressure which is continuous in time with value in Hs, supported in 0t times omega, so that the Cauchy problem with data at time 0, given by the initial data, has a unique solution which is continuous in time with value in Hs plus 1 half times Hs, which coincide at time t with the finite state that is given in advance. Okay, so this is a local controllability result. Controllability means that we are able to steer this state to this one in a finite time. Local means that we are working in a ball around zero. It's not a global result, it's a local result. We are working in a neighborhood of zero. And one important point is that the result is true in any time t. For controllability, it is harder to work in small times than in large time, of course, because you want to reach a state in a small time. It is harder than to reach a state in a longer time. What are your estimates on t? Hmm? What are the estimates? Exactly. But M0 depends on t. When t is very small, M0. But uh, how does Px uh, p? blow up as t goes to 0? Yeah, I don't understand. The estimate on p, the pressure. Ah, just bigger. Yes, everything blows up wh when t goes to 0. Yeah, how? This can be computed by the proof. This is an optimization. For linear problem, it's exponential. Okay. So not better. 
Yeah, yeah. from Dominion, like, oh, okay. should be worse. Does this actually depend on Omega? I imagine if you rely on a tiny... Yeah, the constant depends on Omega. No, little s. Excuse me? Does little s depend on Omega? No. No, no, S is universal. In our proof, it is something like 15, but... Does P, does P have a sign? <coughs> P have a sign? No. It could be negative. You have to suck. <laughs> cannot just blow. Yes, we, we, we push and remove. <laughs> yes, that's a good question, to try to find a pressure which is always positive. Okay, so I, I'm going to say only a few words about the proof. The proof uses in a crucial way that we know a lot of things about the study of the Cauchy problem. And we know a lot of things because there, are, there have been many, many studies which has been already described in previous talks, so I, I, I just skip this part. The key point is that this is a dispersive equation. And we are using in a, in a crucial way the fact that the equation is dispersive. This can be most easily seen at the level of the linearized equation. If you neglect gravity to simplify the notation, if you neglect the nonlinear term to consider linearized equation, and if instead of working with psi and eta, which are real value functions, you decide to work with this complex value function u, which is psi minus i dx to the one half eta, then you find that u satisfies this Schrodinger type equation, dTu plus i dx to the 3 half u is equal to the external pressure. So to control this equation is extremely easy because you know explicitly the solution using the Fourier transform. Okay? So the starting point to, for, to study the controllability of the nonlinear equation is to use a similar diagonalization of the nonlinear equation. And this can be done, and this is based in the study in, in our proof, this is based on the study in Eulerian coordinates, which goes back to the work by Zakharov, Craig Sulem, and Lan. And the fact that you can completely parlinearize the equation, and the fact that once you have completely parlinearized the equation, you can symmetrize them and you can furthermore consider various normal forms. So in the end, we, we can manipulate the equation quite easily. And if you allow me to oversimplify, the result is that you can rewrite the water wave system as the following equation. dTu plus V of u dx u plus I dx to the 3 over 4 acting on C of u times dx to the 3 over 4 u is equal to the external pressure, where V and C are real value functions. Okay, so this is an equation similar to this one. So, as I said, the linearized system at the origin has constant coefficient and can be controlled by means of Fourier analysis or many other methods. But this is not enough for our problem since the problem is quasi-linear. Since the problem is quasi-linear, it's not enough to know what happened for the linearized system at the origin. You cannot apply an implicit function theorem working only at the origin. You have to apply a scheme that is based on the analysis of the linearized equation in a neighborhood of the origin. So necessarily, you have to use a scheme, and this scheme has to be based on the analysis of an equation with variable coefficient. And indeed, we seek the external pressure as a limit of solution to approximate control problems with variable coefficient. We use a quasi-linear scheme. So in some sense, the main point is to study uh, a linear equation with variable coefficients which are fixed. Let us denote the you consider a reference state u bar, and you consider the, the operator p, which is dt plus v dx plus i, this term, where v and c are the previous function evaluated at u bar. And we want to control this equation. <coughs> to do so, we are going to transform the operator p in several steps. The first step is to flatten the coefficient of the leading order term. And to do so, we use a change of variable of that form. We use a change of variable in x, replacing a function h, let's say, or by h of tx and plus kappa of tx. And it is convenient to 
multiply here by a prefactor, which is such that the L2 norm in X is preserved. By so doing, you can find that P is conjugated to this operator, Q, which is dt, plus some coefficient W dx, plus i dx to the 3 half, plus r, where r is of order 0. You can further assume by some simple transformation that the mean value of W is 0. It is simple to conjugate this operator to this one, but it is not entirely trivial because the equation is non-local, you have a change of variable, and also because you, you see here you have the constellation of the sub-principal term of order 1 half. You go from an equation of order 3 half to an equation of order 3 half, we should have a, a term, sub-principal term of order 1 half that in fact disappears simply because we choose in an appropriate way a prefactor. So this is the first step. The second step in the analysis is to conjugate this equation to the same without the, derivative, the term W dx. To do so, we, we seek an operator A such that the commutator of A with this term, I dx to the 3 half, plus W dx A is a zero order operator. We want to eliminate this term by means of a com commutator. And if you seek A as a pseudo differential operator, you can do that. This is something we did with Petrobaldi to study the standing wave problem, the small divisors problem. And we found an operator of this form. A is a pseudo differential operator whose symbol is of the form some amplitude Q of Tx and Xi times an exponential, exponential of i beta of Tx Xi to the 1 half where the function beta in the phase is the sum of a function depending only on time and some periodic int primitive of the value. It is possible to find the periodic primitive because the value has mean value 0. Then with this operator <coughs> you can conjugate this evolution equation to this one with constant coefficient plus a reminder term of order 0. Maybe you have one has to take care because here A is a pseudo differential operator, but it is a pseudo differential operator in this exotic class, S0 rho rho, with rho is equal to 1 half. And this reflects the fact that the equation is quasi linear. Okay? Because if you consider instead of a semi linear equation, here you put a coefficient 2 or you consider the Benjamin Ono equation. You find a similar conjugation, for example, with the pseudo differential operator in the standard or model class as 0, 1, 0. Well, so this is how we proceed, the scheme of the proof. There are some many things to do, of course, but just to explain to you that we reduce ourselves to a constant coefficient case. So now we know the phase of oscillation in time of the solution. And these phase are the ones given by integrating this evolution equation and taking into account the fact that in the conjugation process we have an exponential factor that modifies the phase. Okay? So in the end we are reduced to the following inequality from harmonic analysis, which is called Ingham inequality. Ingham in what is an Ingram inequality? This, this is a Planchrel type inequality but which apply for pseudo-periodic function. Why? Planchrel is for periodic function. Ingram is for pseudo-periodic function. And here the variable x is seen as a parameter. Okay? And we drop it. What is important is the dependence in time. So the inequality that we are using is the following one. For some given real value function beta, which is a smooth function, C3, you introduce these phases of oscillation, mu n of t, which is the sine of n, n is an integer, times n to the 3 half times t, plus beta of t times n to the 1 half. These are exactly the phase of oscillation of this term, n to the 3 half, 
And here, you introduce a phase, beta times n to the 1 half. Okay? And then we, we can prove the following result. For any time t, strictly positive, there are constant c of t and delta of t, such that if beta is small enough, in L infinity norm, smaller than delta, then for any L2 sequence wn, the integral in time of the L2, the L2 norm of this function controls the L2 norm of W. Okay? This is like Blanchard inequality, except that this phase, this, this function is not periodic. Okay? It's not periodic. Does C grow like T? <coughs> Does C grow like T? No, the, you can compute explicitly everything. When when t is larger than some constant, depending on the... If you consider only the high frequency case, you have a very good control of the constant. If you consider a sequence where n is larger than some, some number, and zero, you have a very good control of the constant. When you consider a, a t very small, you have exponential factor also. There is a low frequency problem here. <coughs> So this is Ingram type inequality. When you don't have beta, this inequality goes back to work of Ingram when t is large enough, and Karen Ball and Slemrod and Arrow for any time t. Here we are forced to consider the case where beta is non-zero. The fact this introduces a sub-principal problem, because here you have difference of order one, but it is not a perturbative term simply because <coughs> exponential of, of i n to the 1 half t minus 1 is not small, okay? This is not a perturbative problem, but we can follow the proof given by arrow in the case beta equal and 0 and adjust it to consider this case. Once you have this Ingram type inequality where x is seen as a parameter, you apply it for every x, and you integrate in x, and you obtain an observability inequality. And I am going to state this observability inequality. So you consider a domain omega, which is a, b, included in t, and a given time t, positive. You assume that v solves your evolution, this evolution equation without source term and an initial data, v naught. You assume that your coefficient v and the difference between c and 1 is small enough. Then you have this observability inequality. The integral in time of the integral over omega of v of tx squared dx dt is bigger than the energy, which is the integral over the torus of v of 0x squared dx. OK, so this is an observability inequality. By looking at the solution only above omega, you can have an information about the energy everywhere, the energy of the solution. This is an observability inequality. And this is indeed a key point. To conclude from observability to controllability is based on a usual argument that is called the Hilbert uniqueness method, which is a duality argument going back to the work of Jacques Williams. The idea is very simple. It is based on risk representation theorem. This inequality tells you that you have a coercive bilinear form. So you can apply risk representation theorems that tell you that something exists. And the thing that exists is related to the fact that your control is, exists. Okay? And since you have an Hilbert product, you have a scalar product which is localized, the thing that exists will also be localized. So you have the existence of a control that is localized. This is only for the linearized equation at some state, refund state. In L2, then you have to, to prove a similar result in Sobolev spaces, and you have to prove some stability estimates to prove that the scheme is converging. This is quite technical, and I don't want to enter into the details of this part. What I would like to do is to explain something instead about stabilization which will be also, in the end, related to another way of thinking observability. 
what I want to discuss now is, unless you have questions on this part, yes? So is it the right way to think that uh, basically the observability is this inequality? Yes. Okay. So that you can say for any system, it has nothing to do with the... It's basically any system that's the inequality you're looking to prove. And yes, for wave equation, for Schrodinger equation, for all equation, observability inequalities and uh, inequality of that type. You look at the solution. It's a quantitative unique continuation result. Okay, if the solution vanishes above 0 t times omega, then the solution is 0 everywhere. So controllability has to do with wave generation, which is of course very important in a wave tank, but there is also in a wave tank another thing which is very important, which is wave absorption. The reason is very simple. The reason is that many problems in water wave theory require to study the behavior of wave propagating in unbounded domain. Like the wave you can see on the open sea. On the other hand, for obvious reasons, the numerical or experimental analysis of the water wave equation requires to work in a bounded domain. Of course. So you have to, okay, you have to do something to simulate a bounded domain working in bounded domain. Numerically, there are two approaches that, that can be used. Either you can truncate the domain by introducing an artificial boundary, and you seek for artificial boundary conditions. This goes back to work for by Inquist and Maida. Or you can also try to dump outgoing wave in an absorbing zone surrounding the computational boundary. Okay? You add a, compu uh, a layer surrounding the computational domain where you dump outgoing wave. This is for the numerical analysis. I am going to present something which has to do with the experimental study of water wave. Okay, this is, I, I will show you a movie. This, was, this movie uh, was done at the École Centrale de Nantes. I, I visited uh, Félicien Bonnefoy and Guillaume Ducrozet who kindly showed me a wave tank and kindly allow me to, to show this movie. So in this movie you are going to see a wave tank. This is a swimming pool. A very gi giant swimming pool, 50 meters, 50 meters long. Here you have something like 25 meters. The depth of the basin is 5 meters. And you have two sides of the wave tank. On one side you generate wave. On the left-hand side you generate wave. And on the right-hand side, okay, you are going to generate wave like the, the swell on the open sea. And here you are going to dump the wave. Because otherwise the, the wave are going from the left to the right, and then they bounce back in the basin, and this is chaos, okay? So here you generate, here you damp. So this is a picture of the swimming pool. Excuse me. This is a picture of the swimming pool. This is the left side of the tank where this paddle will be used to generate the wave. And on the right side of the tank, there is an absorbing device, which is extremely simple. This is a passive device, which you introduce an artificial beach. Like a kind of beach you have on the coast. Waves are, are coming to this beach and are going to blow up, of course, like on the beach. And blow up dissipates energy. I am going to show you a picture, a schematic picture of the beach. Here it is a, okay, the plan. Here it is a picture of the beach from above. It is here, okay. It does not touch the bottom of the wave tank. Here you can see wave generated in the wave tank. They travel from the left to the right. These are highly nonlinear waves. They propagate. And ultimately, okay, they dissipate all their energy when they reach the beach. You see that nothing is going back in the swimming pool. Okay. This is for the experimental study of water wave. Of course, this is not something you are going to do to stabilize mathematically or numerically the water wave equation because we don't understand blow up, of course. 
if you want to stabilize the equation mathematically or numerically, there is something much simpler to do, which is to dissipate energy in a surrounding layer by using again the idea of blowing above the free surface. Okay? Here there is a picture, the, the wave generating in a wave tank as above, periodic wave traveling to the right. And then we want to find a way to blow above the free surface so that we dissipate the energy. Okay? We want to absorb water wave in the neighborhood of x equal L by means of an external counteracting pressure. The problem is the following. Let us denote by H the energy of the fluid at time t, which is the sum of two terms, the potential energy and the kinetic energy. Potential energy is the L2 norm of eta plus the integral on the fluid domain of the square root of 1 plus eta x squared. And the kinetic energy is one half of the L2 norm of the velocity. And the goal is to find a, a feedback law for the pressure Px such that Px will be included in, su compactly supported in L minus delta L. Px will be located here. The energy is decreasing and the integral in time of the energy will be controlled by a constant time h0. And what I have forgotten to, to write is that we want a feedback law. That is, we want that Px is defined as a function of eta and psi. Okay? It's a passive way. It is a function of eta and psi by contrast with the control problem. So why do you, uh, we want to make the energy decrease, of course, because we want to dump energy. This condition, what is the reason of this condition? Simply because if this is true, and if h is decreasing, h of t is smaller than the mean of h, that is smaller than 1 over divided by t of the integral of h of t, which is, because of this, smaller than capital C divided by capital T, h of 0. Which means that you have a dumping whenever capital T is bigger than C. Of course, h of t will be smaller than some fraction time h of 0. Which means that, in fact, you have exponential decay simply because you can iterate this. h at time n times capital T will be smaller than capital C divided by T to the n times the initial energy. So whenever you have this property and whenever the fluid exist on long enough time interval, you have exponential decay of the energy, which is stabilization. So now the question is to find a feedback law that allows to obtain this property. So the first question is to find a feedback law that allows to dissipate energy. And this can be done straightforwardly using the Hamiltonian formulation. We are going to find an Hamiltonian dumping based on the fact as First observe I back Zakharov that the equations are Hamiltonian. They can be written under this form. dt of eta is equal to the derivative of the energy with respect to psi. dt of psi is equal to minus the derivative of the energy with respect to eta, minus the external pressure. Then the derivative of the energy can be written in this form, of course. You use the consolation coming from the fact that the equation is Hamiltonian, and it remains only this part that is minus the integral of dt eta times the external pressure. So you want that this is negative to dissipate energy. So simply, you choose, for example, Px as a cutoff function chi multiplying dt of eta. Then, of course, this term will be positive, and dt of eta will, d, dt of h will be negative. And this explains that this choice, this feedback law, OK? This feedback law is widespread in the numerical analysis of water wave whenever you want to dump energy, to dump outgoing wave in a surrounding layer. And the question is to understand why this feedback law, <coughs> which is localized, allows to prove a global decay of the energy. OK? I am going to show you a numerical experiment done with Emmanuel Dormy. It is extremely easy because it is an experiment for linearized equation, okay? just to, to test it. 
It is extremely easy for a linearized equation because you can solve the equation using Fourier transform. And you are going to see that it works very well. Here we are generating wave by blowing here above the free surface on the left and we generate a periodic wave train that is traveling to the right. And on the right we're using the damping, th this damping. And it works very well, we are able to produce a traveling wave propagating from the left to the right and never bouncing back. Or with at least not so much reflection. Okay, so it works very well, at least numerically. And the next statement says that it works also, the, the, this theorem explains in some sense uh, the previous stabilization result. Statement is the following, you assume that as above the external pressure is equal to chi of x times dt eta minus some time dependent function just to ensure that px has mean value zero. Where chi is some well chosen coefficient. Then you can prove two things, firstly there exists two positive constants, delta and C, depending only on the physical parameter, which are G, gravity, kappa, surface tension coefficient, H, the depth, and L, the size of the container, such that if eta and its first derivative in L infinity norm are smaller than delta, and if the solution exists on the time interval 0C, then, oh, excuse me, You have h of t <coughs> smaller than h of 0 divided by 2 for any t larger than c, capital C, okay? Because here you have there exists c and for any t larger than c. So you have decay of the energy. But this raises, of course, the question of is it possible to have a solution which exists on the time interval 0 c? And is it possible to iterate this argument to obtain exponential decay? And this question is solved at least partially by the second statement. There exists a constant C star such that if the initial data are small enough in this space, smaller than epsilon, then the solution exists and is of size epsilon on a time interval of size C star over divided by epsilon. Okay? So you can prove the existence of the solution at an arbitrary long time interval. Okay, so I am going to say just a few words about the proof. Firstly, some words about the study of the Cauchy problem. No, excuse me. Firstly, a word about the fact that I claim that chi has to be well chosen, at least for my method. How I choose chi is the following. I start from a function kappa, then I define a function m, then I, I define the cutoff function chi. I start from a cutoff function kappa supported in minus LL, even and equal to 1 on a large time interval. Then I define a function m, which is a multiplier, which is equal to x kappa of x. Then chi of x is equal to 1 minus the derivative of m. This produces a cutoff function chi, which is not as usual. As usual, you will define something like that. But this is, a, this is a kind of function chi we use. Okay, now a word about the Cauchy problem. As above, we are working in a container. We symmetrize and we periodize. So we are reduced to study the, the Cauchy problem for the weather wave equation with periodic data. And with the previous analogy, you can think of the dump water wave system as this equation. DTU plus V of U dx U plus I dx to 3 half U plus chi of X dx U is equal to zero. If you want to prove that the solution with size epsilon exists on the time interval of size one of epsilon, you need to prove, as usual, uniform estimates in epsilon for this equation. You divide this linear term by epsilon. Here, there is no epsilon here because I am assuming that V depends linearly on U. Okay. So you see that the damping term does not help for the study of the Cauchy problem because in, in fact it adds a term 
with variable coefficient, a singular term. So you have to be to take care. It's not difficult, but you, ha you have to take care to this point. It's not straightforward to prove that uh, this, uh, the size, the life spine is one of epsilon. It's not difficult, but it is not straightforward. So I'm not entering into the detail because it's a classical uh, analysis. What is much more interesting, uh, f from, my, from my point of view, is to study the, the stabilization. As I said, damping, to prove that the energy is decreasing, is extremely easy because this is based only on the Hamiltonian formulation of the equation. What is more interesting is to prove that the energy converges to zero. It is more difficult because the equation is quasi-linear and non-local. Okay? And at first, when I studied this problem, my motivation was to, uh, to do this proof was to remove on purpose paradifferential calculus and microlocal analysis. It was on purpose because I wanted to discuss with engineers, people working in physics, and I, I, I wanted on purpose to remove microlocal analysis. And I wanted to use instead global analysis. Instead of working with function of x and xi, working only with integrals, function of integral of some function f and dx. And by so doing, I have found the proof that I would not be able to find using paradifferential calculus. Okay, so this is maybe the, the important thing to remember is that the proof is based only on global quantities. We seek exact identities using global quantities and using six principles. The first is the variational principle for water wave or for regular equation. Second is to use the multiplier's method. We use also a principle of equipartition of energy, positive type identities for the Dirichlet to Neumann operator. We use, as far as possible, conservation laws. And we use the Hamiltonian formulation. Th these are used as principle. And uh, I am going to explain only this, the multiplier's method, how it works for the water wave equation. Firstly, what is the multiplier method in general? In the simplest case, excuse me, in the simplest case, it is used to compute this quantity. You want to compute the integral in time of the energy. <coughs> Let us consider, for example, the 1D wave equation with Dirichlet boundary condition. 1D wave equation, Dirichlet boundary condition. You have this nice identity that can be obtained by multiplying the equation by x dx u. You multiply by x dx u and you integrate by parts in time and space in time and space. And what do you obtain? You obtain this. The integral in time of dx you evaluated at x equal 1 is equal to 2 times this quantity at time t minus this quantity at time 0 plus the integral in time of the energy. Okay. For example, for the wave equation, it's very easy to obtain an expression for the integral in time of the energy, which is this term, which depends only on the boundary behavior of wave, something localized, it is localized on x equal 1, and a term that can be neglected. Why can you neglect this term? The intuition is very simple. This is an integral in time, integral over 0 t, and this does not depend in time. This is the difference at two different values. So when t is very large, this quantity will be very large, while this one will, will have a fixed size. So you can drop this term. So you can compare the integral in time of the energy with something which is localized. Okay? This is a key point. So the key identity for water wave, which was quite surprising, is that you can obtain also an exact identity where all the terms are very simple expression using the multiplier method. Instead of working here with a weight which is x, I work with a weight which is a general C infinity function vanishing at both ends, m equals zero, m zero equal m of l equals zero. You have some two coefficients zeta and rho depending in a very simple way on m and eta. And such that with this weight, if you neglect surface tension to have a simpler statement, you have this relation. The integral in time of the energy plus some term q, I will comment, is equal to something depending on the pressure, a boundary integral in time, an observation term, and a nonlinear term. So I will comment on this term and I stop quickly. 
What is Q? Q is a positive term, so you can neglect it. It is positive, you can neglect, because it, it has a good sign. This is an observation term. Why? Because y minus m of x and x minus m are both equal to 0 and 0 L minus delta. Okay, the weights are equal to 0 there in this direction by the choice of the weight. So this is an observation term. It depends only on the solution near x equal L. And what is interesting is that the, all the terms here are quadratic, which means that the identity is the same for the linearized equation. The only term coming from the nonlinearity is this one, the integral over the free domain of the derivative of rho times phi x times phi y. And this nonlinear term can be very easily compared to the energy, because the energy is controlling phi x squared plus phi x squared. So the only cubic nonlinear term is this one, and it can be controlled by the energy easily, provided that rho of x is in L infinity norm smaller than one half, which is a very reasonable assumption on the smallest condition of it. And I am stopping here. Thank you very much for your attention. And any questions? So, quite a few slides ago, you introduced, you did a change of variables in psi, I think, to make c of u constant. Yes. Is there any analog of that transformation outside of one dimension? Ah, no, the transformation we did are specific to one dimension. M maybe not this one, but this one is very specific to dimension one. In dimension two, you have to use microlocal analysis in a smarter way. Okay. If we go back to the preceding one. Yes. In two dimensions, you also have to use microlocal analysis here? You can, you can flatten the coefficient here also in dimension two. Okay. To flatten the coefficient is something that you can do. This was done in, um, for example, for this problem with third surface tension, this was done by uh, Thibaut de Poiferre and Guillaume, okay? For the study of three cards estimates for water wave. Here, what is really specific to dimension one is the find of this pseudo-differential operator. In dimension two, you, you cannot do this. You have to use microlocal analysis in a smarter way. More questions? Yeah. So I have a question that is, is it true that in, in two dimensions, the difficulty like uh, to prove the, the gap inequality is that the difficulty very low? No, in dimension two, you have to, to, to do something else than in gam. There are, but there are a lot of microlocal analysis tools that you can use. The difficulty is to prove low frequency estimates. Because even for in gam, there, there is this difficulty of proving low frequency estimate, but there are some tricks that you can use in dimension one. In dimension two, you have to do something else. More questions? What's that? Uh Oh. Is that change in variable in dimension one, is that related to uh, Riemann mapping or flattening the domain? I'm gonna, I'm gonna change of variable? Uh, to, to understand the change of variable, you can do exactly the same thing for Schrodinger equation. You consider a Schrodinger equation with a coefficient inside. And if you want to remove, the, to flatten the coefficient, you have to make a change of variable of that form. This will generate a term of order one, which will be a convective derivative, which is with an imaginary coefficient which is quite weird, but it is harmless. And the fact that it is harmless is can be understood by saying that it, is, it can be removed by using an appropriate prefactor. And the prefactor is chosen in such a way that the change of variable, the change of unknown, preserves the L2 norm, which is not the case if we, you make only a change of variable. So if you make only a change of variable, you no longer preserve the L2 norm, so you no longer keep the, the structure of the equation. Okay, more questions? You know, I just have a quick question. So at the end, when you explain the multiplier method, is, that, uh, is this how you know how to select the chi? Is that what tells you how to Yes, this is the, the kind of chi comes from the fact that I am using a multiplier method to prove the stabilization result. Uh, no, 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 no. In fact, it is also, okay. The choice of the chi is more subtle. It is uh, in what I have not explained later. How to use this inequality to prove stabilization is non-trivial. And at some point, you need much more identities. 
and for one of these identities, I am forced to choose Kyle this way. Yeah, that's the speaker again. Thank you very much.